So, is it a sound biblical tactic when pastors uh, discriminatively dismiss individuals who may have legitimate questions concerning their doctrine, concerning some of the doctrines and the statement of the favor of a particular church uh, that uh, may come from a parishioner, someone that is a part of the congregation, or for someone outside, for that matter, who genuinely may have questions in regards to what's being taught. Is it okay for pastors to be dismissive, not have an open door policy, and not entertain the questions of those that ask? The answers to this question when we get back on the other side. Don't forget to like this video if you like it. Click subscribe, click notifications for future contents, and don't forget to share it with a friend. So today's title, uh, family, is Pastors, Stop Avoiding Challengers to Your Beliefs. Pastors, Stop Avoiding Challengers to Your Beliefs. Okay, so what is this topic about? Pastors, Stop Avoiding Challengers to Your Beliefs. Uh, I thought about this, this this particular topic as I just released a video. The, the video that I released is a, um, the, I don't even, I can't remember the title. I'm going to pull that title up for you guys. Uh, the, the topic of, of the video that I released, what, it's a brother that I've been having on the Masculinity Mondays um, stream, Brother Larry Brazaway was located down in Blue Strings, Missouri. And uh, Larry, um, Larry, he, um, this brother is suffering great persecution, you know, um, a difference of opinions and stance between he and his wife, um, and not only between he and his wife, but the church that he was attending with his wife. Uh, long story short, uh, they got into a disagreement. She left. She took the children. They are four children. They've been married for four years. And um, she uh, went to one of the members of uh, the church. Uh, and they, from that moment on, and this was going back since uh, July, I think, 17th. Uh, of this year, this past summer. And that's where she's been staying with the four children. And they, these people and this church have been, you know, housing them. Um, she, he, he was trying to call her initially for the first few weeks. He wasn't getting any answer, any um, response, any, any text messages. Uh, and he had to learn and just find out and figure out actually where they were at. Um, he attempted to go to the house and to no avail um you know uh he wasn't able to see his children she came to the door um and he had some words i believe with the person of the home if i'm not mistaken um uh, but you know disgusting thing when a church injects himself into uh, the affairs of or a pastor in the affairs of a couple and they don't do it according to scripture and, and, and in this case, you know, Larry even went to, to try to, and I know this is not really about his story, but I'm going to include the link in the bottom of the stream after, you know, I, I edited it in a post. And uh, I do encourage you that you go down to the description box or just look on my channel. The title of the, the, the stream or the, the video that I released yesterday is on the subject of yeah this is it this is our churches today committing spiritual adultery and that's that's the title of the the video so i encourage you to go ahead on over um and look at it um and do share it with others because you know this is not only a message that needs to get out um this is a story that people need to know about what this church is doing currently doing to this man, um, he attempted to go up to the church to see his family. Once he, you know, wasn't able to get, he wasn't getting any communication from the wife, and um, you know, he gets to the church, and one of the the uh, uh, 
gentleman from the church. I don't know if he's an elder or what, but he's a uh, he's he's in law enforcement. And um, this gentleman had the door locked or was standing in front of the door, would not allow Larry into the, the church, told him that he was not allowed on the church property. And even though Larry's like, well, my family's in there, he said, well, you know, they're allowed, but you're not allowed, <laughs> you know. Um, and I showed a video a clip that he, you know, he videoed the the incident, and he was turned away. And so, you know, the whole thing is like, you know, should churches be doing that? But I bring all of this up because what Larry is going through, the persecution that he's enduring, a lot of men I find are going through this. I myself have suffered this and am suffering this. You know, I'm still suffering the remnants of, you know, having a pastor whom I loved, a church family that I was a part of, that I thought was my family. They, and, and I only learned that there was my family only up until the point of the truth. You know, once it embarked upon the beliefs, the statements of faith, uh, the, the, the polity of the organization of the denomination, even though it is not spelled out in scripture as such. And what I'm getting at is that, you know, <clears throat> my belief in biblical polygyny, my belief in, uh, you know, and my stance on choosing to take on another wife got me removed from the, the pastoral ministerium of the church that I was a part of. I was, um, uh, you would say the associate pastor there and i and i got removed because of my belief because of my stance on polygyny was the reason why and it was based off of and what i was told from the pastor that it was based off of the church polity and and it wasn't based on uh scripture and so <laughs> this is what's going on you have you know churches you have pastors who hold positions that are not necessarily within scripture or uh, that differ in scripture or it may a, a differing of understanding of scripture and what is happening is that they're not facilitating they're not allowing opportunity to engage they're not allowing opportunity to have dialogue and discourse they're not allowing um their views their positions the church's positions to be questioned um, you know, there are those topics where they just won't go because they know that it's volatile. They know that it's controversial and they know that, you know, oftentimes they don't even have answers. They just know that this is what the organization uh, policy is or says on a particular matter. And that's it. And they don't question it. You know, it's above their head as they see it, uh, which the only thing that should be above their head should be the word of God. The only thing that should be above their head is what scripture says. And, and so men are finding out when it comes to masculinity, biblical masculinity, bi biblical authority and, and headship in the home of uh, uh, family structure, as our brother Pete titles his book. Men are finding out that, you know, the church is preferring to their traditions rather than to the Bible. And the church is not willing to sit down and have dialogue, which is what happened to Brother Larry. Um, he, you know, he asked to sit down. They would not sit down with him. It was an attitude of being dismissed or being dismissive is what he experienced. Uh, you know, they would not talk with him. They would not engage with him. Uh, he's posted live videos requesting to, to, to have a sit down and talk about it. But nevertheless, the church of this particular church, uh, the name of the church is Crossway Bible Church in Blue Springs, Missouri. Uh, they decided to, you know, pick the side of his wife because it's in alignment with theirs and shut the husband out um, and even call the police on him. And so the, the question is, going back to our title of today is, you know, should pastors even be in the business or should churches be in the business of avoiding challenges to their beliefs you know is this how is this how the assembly 
And, you know, I know we're accustomed to using that word church, but the word church is not even a biblical term. The New Testament, quote unquote, uh, term is the church in English, right? But the, the transliteration of the word or that is spelled out within the manuscripts is ecclesia. And ecclesia means the assembly. It means those who are the called out ones, the gathering. That's what ecclesia means. Um, and so when we think of church, you know, with, we, we often think of this building, this edifice. We think of this, this, this erected, you know, building with this steeple on the top of it. And so people often align church with the building and the location. When Yeshua says, upon this rock, I build my ecclesia, uh, he was talking about the same assembly that he has been building ever since. And I've gone through this on previous videos. Brother Pete Rambo has eloquently gone through this in a number of his videos, and I encourage you to go over to his channel. Uh, but this goes all the way back to Mount Sinai. You know, when the children of Israel assembled as an assembly, as a congregation, and the same words that's used um, in the Hebrew is transliterated in the Septuagint, which is the same Greek word in the New Testament, ecclesia. Uh, and so I believe the, the Hebrew word is kahal. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I believe the word is kahal. And so... The, the the problem is, is that pastors are being dismissive. They don't have an answer. They don't want to entertain anything that is controversial to whatever their protocol or their platform or their uh, polity or uh, their business as usual they have going on. They don't want to disrupt or ruffle the feathers, if, if, if you would. Um, they don't want to do that because they don't have answers. They don't have, and this is the reason why I believe that a lot of people, not just men, but a lot of people, you know, have been abandoned uh, Western Christianity for that matter because it's 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 not easy to get the tough questions answered. Oftentimes, there's shallow answer. Um, some question, some answer that doesn't really make sense. Oftentimes, it's rooted in tradition. Uh, it's root, it's rooted in uh, church polity, and it's not necessarily coming from scripture. It's not a scriptural scriptural answer that is often given to the questions that people have. And so, you know, is it even a biblical thing to be dismissive because someone is asking you about? your belief? Is it even uh, uh, biblical to uh, not entertain those who want answers, uh, those who uh, do not fully understand, they do not fully get why things are practiced or said a certain way in the church? And so that's what this topic is about today. And, and I wanted to dig into it. I'm not going to my attempt is not to be before you guys long. I have a, a list of scriptures that I definitely want to go through and uh, prayerfully we'll get some edification um, out of this uh, as we dig into this and we journey through this particular topic this morning. Um, the, the first passage that I want to go to um, is in First Peter. So let me present screen. All right, so here we go. We're up. Uh, and let's pull up our Blue Dare Bible tab. All right, First Peter. Read. Start from the 13th verse. First Peter 3 13. All right, so here it is. Peter's writing, and he says, And who is there to harm you 
if you prove zealous for what is good. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed and do not fear their fear and do not be troubled. You know, one of the things that is important to recognize is that the reality of suffering for righteousness sake, the, re the reality of suffering for the truth, it's a reality. It's a, it's a must for us, for us as being disciples, for us as being followers of, of the way, for us as being a part of the assembly, the kahal of Yeshua. It is a part of this whole deal. You know, it is a part of going down this path. It is impossible to go down this path. And we'll see this in the next scripture that I'm going to present. It says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? In other words, you prove to be a person that have zeal. You prove to be a person that, that's earnest. You prove a person that is motivated. You prove to be a person that have a drive for what is good. But even if you should suffer, he says in the next verse, for the sake of righteousness you are blessed in other words you're happy um is what the word is transliterated and do not fear their fear and do not be troubled uh see because when he says their fear these are things that they would fear they would fear being harmed for doing good they would fear being troubled for doing the right thing, which is the reason why they don't do the right thing. <laughs> and so he says, but do this. He says, but sanctify. In other words, set apart, you know, put it in a special place. Messiah as Adonai in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and with fear. So Peter is telling the, the folks that he is writing to that it, the first thing that they need to do in response to being troubled or being uh, approached or uh, having, how would you say, uh, either conflict, contradiction, con contention, uh, variants coming to them right approaching them he says the first thing he says to do here he says is to make a separate place for messiah uh in your hearts always be ready always be ready so i think right off the back i think this destroys you know the question should or answers the question should pastors be dismissive or avoid challenges to their beliefs you know uh, right off the back, this gives answer to that question, you know, and I think we could pack up, wrap it up and, and call it a day. But he says, always be ready. So in other words, always have a mindset, an attitude, a preparedness, right? A preparedness to make a defense. So you should always be, which, how do you get there? The only way that one can get there is that they have to study. The only way that they can get there is they have to be prayed up. The only way that they get there, they have to be employing currently in their lives um, um, a meditative state um, of spiritual disciplines. They have to be prepared by having the word so much in them that they're, they're prepared to give a defense. Now, what, what does he mean by defense here? Let me click the highlight. It's an argument or an explanation. So um, that's what a defense is. It, you know, it's the Greek word apologia. Uh, and that's all he's saying. He's saying is always be ready to be able to give an explanation. So if someone comes to challenge you here because he says he says to everyone who asks you 
So everyone who asks you, uh, and if this is basic, you know, if this is a letter that is generally going to the saints, so this is not just for the layman, this is certainly for the leaders, this is certain for pastors. So if the if the the people within the congregation who is considered the laity, right, uh, are to be prepared, should not the pastor be prepared to give an answer? Should they be able to give an explanation for why the church policy uh, says this or says that, or why the church does it this way and does that, and the Bible says this? Why do we do these things such as uh, wedding ceremonies that are not even in the Bible, for that matter? Like, why is the church doing this? Why do the men in the Bible have multiple wives and you never see, you know, Yahweh, the father rebuking them or forbidding them from the practice? You see him um, blessing them with it, even in some instances, commanding them to do it. Uh, but you never see him uh, having any avarice against the practice of polygyny, a man having multiple wives. And so the question is, you know, why is the church pushing one man, one woman only? Why is the church uh, pushing uh, these things that, you know, seem to make the pastor uh, somehow have this authority to counsel a man's wife when scripture says otherwise? Uh, wh where is this coming from? Where does this where do they get this from? And, and so a pastor's responsibility, a shepherd's responsibility is to be equipped, always be ready, always be prepared to be able to give an answer and at any moment that they are approached. So at no point based off of this passage alone, should a pastor be in the business of being dismissive, of turning someone away because um, A, you know, they're not able to answer because first of all, you should even be a pastor if you don't even know how to answer the question. You know, you should even be in charge. Uh, the, the other thing is turning them away is because you're more loyal to an organization than you are to the Bible. That even disqualifies you even further for not being a pastor. And so, you know, this is the problem here is you have those who sit in leadership position and they are not equipped. They are ill-equipped but nevertheless, they are leading people. So Yeshua said, is the blind lead the blind? They both will fall into the ditch. And he said this concerning the Pharisees because they were blind gods. They were blind leaders. And they were imposing traditions on the people that were not rooted in scripture. And um, and, and they really had no answers for it. And they, they couldn't really answer the people's questions. And so it's the same thing that's going on 2,000 years later. You have many so-called quote-unquote shepherds of these local assemblies who are leading people but yet are ill-equipped from being able to answer simple questions concerning the faith, concerning scriptures, basic things, elementary things. And so he says, to make a defense, an answer to everyone who asks you to give an account. In other words, pastors, you are accountable to Yahweh first. You are accountable to Messiah. You are accountable to the Ruach, the Holy Spirit of God. You are accountable to the brethren. You are accountable to the people. So you are in no position to be dismissive or be turning someone away who asks her questions. He says, to who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and fear. So just the whole attitude and the idea of, or the audacity to be dismissive, that's not being gentle. That's not being reverential. That's not being uh, respective when you dismiss someone whom you are accountable to. I mean, just think about it. <laughs> you know, many of these pastors, you know, who embrace uh, prescriptive monogamy, who teach it, um, who command that that's the only acceptable practice within the 
borders of their church, right? The boundaries within their church, right? And many of them have wives. Uh, are you accountable to your wife when she has a question to you, to, for you? Um, when she's asking you, uh, how are the kids going to eat? Are you going to be dismissive? When she's asking you to be intimate with her, are you going to be dismissive? No, you're going to be reverential to your woman because you know better. You know you have an obligation. So why do you not think, according to scripture here, that you not have an obligation to Almighty Yahweh? To El Shaddai, why do you think that you are not accountable to the people that you shepherd? That you don't have to give them an answer? You just be dismissive and you just push, you know, send them off because, you know, you don't want to deal with it. <laughs> You're in the wrong practice if you don't want to deal with it. Moses, Moshe, Moses' uh, father-in-law, uh, Jephthah, Jephthah had to advise him, sit him down, father him, give him wisdom and tell him, you can't answer all of the people's questions and judge in their matters and the way that you're doing, Moses, the way you're doing it, you're going to wear yourself out. You know, you, you have to share this responsibility. You got to appoint others to help you in this task. So what was the task? The task was in answering questions that people have in matters that they had disagreements with others with about. You know, so the shepherd's responsibility all the way back from the beginning of the assembly, of the chachal, of the ecclesia, you see shepherds and shepherds appointed to answer questions, to answer matters, to give a defense, to give an explanation with gentleness and with reverence, with fear, with respect, with dignity, not be dismissive, not turning people away. He says, having a good conscience so that uh, in the thing in which you are slandered, those who disparage your good conduct in Messiah will be put to shame. So once you know that you've, you, number one, you've prepared yourself, you know, you've, you've sanctified his truth in a, in a separate place inside your heart. So that and it's so much inside of you that it's just second nature. You're able to give an answer and you're willing to give an answer because you are accountable. Right. Uh, for this hope or whatever this thing that you believe in, whatever the things that you trust in, whatever it is your statements of faith are. That's your hope. Right. Because you're putting your your confidence in a belief in something that, you know, you can't readily see. Um it, it, you, you're putting your trust and your confidence that this is the right thing, right? Uh, and you are willing to do this with gentleness and with fear. And he says you're have and having a good conscience because you will have a good conscience once you do all of that. So that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who disparage your good conduct in Messiah will be put to shame. For it is better if... It is better if Yahweh should or should will it so that you suffer for doing good rather than for doing wrong. And, and, and that is so profoundly true. It is better to suffer for good than for what is wrong. Um, and, and the fear that many of these pastors have is that they're going to be challenged. They don't have an answer for it. They're going to be proven wrong. They may have to humble themselves um, and tell their people that they were wrong. And oftentimes they don't want to do that, especially if whatever it is they built, whether it's a mega church or what have you, uh, a lot of it is built on those traditions and those lies. And so they don't want to have to go to the people and tell the people that, hey, I've been, you know, doing this the wrong way or what have you. I think recently Creflo Dollar a few months, so-called, quote unquote, uh, recanted or repented from verbally from the things that he was teaching concerning uh, tithing and uh, uh, giving offerings and what have you, but he never he never returned any of the money 
So that that's another thing that showed that he, you know, his was his uh, so-called repentance or revising of his position uh, was it legitimate? You know, Benny Hinn did that a few years back as well. You know, talking about all of the things that he was teaching and turning healing and whatnot that it wasn't biblically correct and so forth, whatnot and. You know, the, but he didn't return the money. You, you didn't you didn't hear anything of the, him, neither of these guys, uh, you know, actually going as far as Zacchaeus did in the book of Luke. I believe it's Luke 17 or 13, uh, where he was in the sycamore tree. And, you know, he you know, when he approached Messiah Yeshua, he he told him that he repented and he he. Um, he restored anyone that he robbed and stole from uh, four times over. So in other words, he didn't just say he was sorry. Um, he didn't just stop doing what he was doing. He also made efforts to financially repair the damage that he caused. And so, you know, that's 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 the heart of true repentance. And, and pastors don't want to go that far. Modern day pastors in the Christian church do not want to go that far to restore what's right. So they look at um, aligning with the truth as something not being worthy of them suffering for. They don't want to suffer for doing what is good. They don't want to suffer for what is what is what is the scriptures deem as being right. And so therefore what do they do? They continue to fake the funk. They continue to live the life of a lie. They they continue to wear the mask of a hypocrite. Why? Because they don't want to be accountable. They don't want to be found out to be wrong. Let's look, let's look elsewhere. Let's go to another scripture. Uh, first, first Timothy, no, excuse me, second Timothy 3, 10 on down. It says, but you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, qualities of a leader for sure. Then the second line, he says in verse 11, persecutions and suffering such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all of the Lord rescued me. So Paul is, is teaching Timothy, who is an understudy of his, who is a mentee of his. Paul is uh, Timothy's uh, leader, his his father in the faith, he is uh, he's meant he is mentor, um, and he has placed him in his position as a young evangelist to set up and structure this 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 ecclesia and the city of Ephesus that that Paul had recently uh, established uh, planted, and so he's giving him instructions in these books. In and how to establish these this the structure of this assembly, and so he's letting him know about the examples that he set before Timothy, and how Timothy followed him in that, even to the point of following him in the persecutions, which goes to what I said, and y'all said that you know, um, it's just part of this path that we're gonna deal with, and we're gonna have to endure persecutions. There's no way around this. We can't reign, expect to reign with him and we're not willing to be suffering with him. And so he says in the 12th verse, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Messiah Yeshua will be persecuted. Will be persecuted. All who uh, desire to live godly in Messiah Yeshua will be persecuted. So persecution is part of the program. If you don't want to, my suggestion, if you don't want to be persecuted, it is better for you to never have put your, your hand to the plow than to put it to it and you ain't going to do it the right way. And you're not going to embrace everything that comes with it. And so it's important to know and important to, to consider the fact that it is no way of doing this life without enduring persecution. He says, but evil men, right? And imposters, you know, phonies, fakes, fake preachers, right? Will proceed from bad to worse. So not only are they bad, they're going to get worse. 
deceiving and being deceived. So they're deceiving and being deceived. So they're being deceived uh, by what they're being taught. They're being deceived by what they study. They're being deceived. Why? Because their whole modus operandi is on deceiving the people. They know what the word says, but they want to tell you something different. They know scripture says one thing, but they think that it's better to give you something else. And so therefore they are being deceived themselves. But you, he tells Timothy, continue in the things you learned and became convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them. And that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise, wise enough to give answers, wise enough to give a defense, wise enough to answer whatever questions that a person may have, even if they come in to challenge you, right? Uh, unto salvation through faith, which is in Messiah Yeshua. All scripture, right? All Yah breathed is God breathed and uh, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. You know, the clear, the interesting thing, and this is going back to the brother example that I was talking about, my brother Larry Bazaway. The church was dismissive to him because they didn't agree with his beliefs on biblical polygyny and other things, right? Embracing the Torah, keeping the Torah, observing the Sabbath. They didn't agree with him on it. So they were dismissive towards him, right? And the very scriptures, you know, we are, we've been often taught in Christianity, you know, the Old and the New Testament is scripture. But Paul is not talking about what's written in the New Testament here. He's talking about what is written in Torah and the prophets. Uh, that is what was known in the first century as being scripture. And so he says all scripture, because that's what they lived by. That's what they, they guided themselves based on. That's where they got their instructions from. That's those where the apostles took their principles. Seventy percent of what the apostles were quoting from, you know, the, that they were teaching, what they were laying down, was quoted directly from what is called the Old Testament, the the Torah, the prophets, uh, the Tanakh. That's where they got it from. And so when he says all Scripture, that's where he's talking about is God breathed and profitable for teaching. For, so even all scripture that include polygamy is profitable for teaching. All scripture that, you know, talks about male headship and authority, that right there is profitable for teaching, right? For reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So all of that is profitable for these uh, disciplines, these virtues. So that, why? So that the man of Yah may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so you're not going to have the word of Messiah uh, set apart inside your heart. And you're not going to be ready if you don't first believe what Paul is saying here. If you don't believe that all of Torah is profitable for that purpose and you are rejecting certain aspects of scripture because it doesn't align with your cultural traditions right your secular traditions your pagan traditions it doesn't align with it you don't agree with it you are at aberrance against it right so you don't accept it you don't accept what it says you don't reject it as being from the breath of Yahweh. You don't accept it as coming from the mouth of God. And so therefore it can't profit you. So you can't you you can't use these scriptures, these specific texts to answer the questions that someone may be asking you about because you've already been not only did you dismiss the individual that's coming to 
to, to get answers to their questions, you've dismissed the word of Yah. You have dismissed inspired texts of Yahweh that he has personally breathed um, into the, the mind and the hearts of the men that wrote this. You have personally rejected the voice of Yahweh. And that's why you can't answer the questions. That's the reason why you're not even equipped. So that the man of Yahweh may be equipped, having been, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's go to another scripture. I'm not going to be before you long. Let me go through a few more scriptures. Matter of fact, let's go to Jeremiah 23. Okay. Jeremiah 23, uh, the prophet writes, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture declares Yahweh. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are my who are shepherding my people, right? You have scattered my flock and banished them. You you turned them away. You've been dismissive to them in your variance to the truth, in your indifference towards uh humility and and what the spirit is truly saying you banished my people you banished them and have not attended to them behold i am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds so you pastors who have turned away the flock because uh for some of a reason, you think that you're smarter than Almighty Yahweh. You, you think that you are able to edit. Uh, you you put more pride in and more stock in when you learned in seminary about uh, these so-called fathers of the faith, right? These the 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 so-called uh, fathers of the Reformation Reformation movement whether it be uh, an, um, uh, Martin Luther or whether it be John Calvin or whether it be Augustine uh, and the like. You put more stock in uh, these preachers, these historical preachers of whether it's a Charles Spurgeon, you know, uh, Wesley. It doesn't matter. You put more stock, you put more trust, you put more faith, you, you've set apart in your heart what these men who have, who have, uh, you, you, you hold as your leaders, your teachers, you have put more stock in what they said and then what Almighty Yahweh said. And for this reason, whenever you're approached with the question, because you're only limited to what these men taught you and not what scripture teaches, you're not able to give an answer concerning what does Yahweh think about it? What does the creator think? What is in the mind of the father concerning this question that this particular parishioner or this particular member of your congregation is asking? It says, uh, my flock and banish them and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares Yahweh. And so th this is what has happened. And you know, one of the things that he says to the, he's, uh, he's giving his um, his variance against the, the prophets, the false prophets, you know, for lying to the people. Let me go right here. Just 30. I'm just skimming around. I don't have the time to go through the whole chapter. Um, verse 30 says, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who steal my words from each other. Uh, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who take their tongues and declare Yahweh declares. So they love to tell you these, these pastors, you love to tell you, thus saith the Lord. They love to tell you that God told me. <laughs> they love to tell you that, you know, the spirit of God just, you know, dropped in my spirit, you know, but. When it comes to the word, when it comes to the truth, when it comes to the scripture, they pick and choose. They cherry pick. Another 
passage that I think hits on this is in Malachi 2. You know, and this is the go-to book, um, often it's chapter 3 here, where these pastors, you know, love to use this to coerce people to give money through tithing. Well, a false <laughs> um, breakdown or an, an accurate breakdown of tithing, because when you study what Torah actually teach, what tithing is, what these pastors are demanding on people is not even biblical tithing. You know, you know, tithing was often was always given through crop and through animal. The the fat, you're not the fat, but the 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 meat from the animals and the fat of the lambs. That's what tithing consisted of, and that was the contribution. Uh, tithing was not money. Money was only used in Torah to purchase the animals and the grain and the wine yeah oh yes D wine was a part of it so drinking wine was a part of tithing but this is the stuff that they gloss over they don't teach all of this stuff that's in deuteronomy 12 deuteronomy 26 deuteronomy 14 they don't teach it they focus on chapter th three when it tells the people of israel uh to bring in uh, the tithes and offerings that they are under, under a curse for not bringing in their tithes and offerings and not really fully understanding and not fully giving the full teaching of what scripture actually says concerning tithing. And so it's only a manipulation tactic that the, the church does or these churches do. And this goes all the way back to the Roman Catholic Church earlier days, you know, when uh, the church and the state became one entity they were still they were still the roman empire they were still into building and conquering people that's the reason why it was no problem with them starting the slave trade you know in the name of jesus and so um in doing so they built castles they built palaces they built cathedrals and it took money it required money and so one of the ways in which they sought to get the money from the people was they started to introduce this this perverted form of tithing uh biblical tithing a perverted uh version or interpretation of it uh to the people in order to coerce them and so protestants who continue in that same vein they're only they're only you know following the the, the teachings and the prescriptions of their parent which is the roman catholic church and so um and so that book that is all to you but really the, the the core essence of the rebuke of this particular book is not to the people not giving the tithes but it's mainly to the priests who were misinterpreting scripture and i, I want you to catch this he says now and this commandment is for you O priest if you if you do not listen and if you do not set up upon your heart to give honor to my name says Yahweh of, of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them already because you are not setting it upon your heart. One of the, the delusions of false teachers, and that's why you can see a lot of them, especially with the prosperity gospel, right? Um, Very rich, you know, make a lot of money. They sell books and what have you. You know, your TD fakes and your, your klepto dollar, <laughs> you know, make a lot of money in, in what they're doing. And, and in your, your Joel Osteen's, you know, it, they're robbing and they're fleecing people by using uh, tithing in an abusive way. Or what the scripture says concerning tithing in a misinterpreted, out of context, abusive way. And he says here he says he says your blessings he says i will curse your blessings and indeed i have already cursed them so how how is td jake's blessings cursed how would a man like joel osteen's blessings be already cursed well it's cursed in a sense that um it doesn't come from him it doesn't come from yahweh and it all the further delusion. Remember, we read in the previous scripture that 
they are deceiving and they are being deceived. That's where their blessing is, is, is at its core being a curse to them because it is, it is not allowing them to even see the truth. That is the reason why Yeshua said that he spoke to the Pharisees in parables, that hearing they do not hear, seeing that they do not see. Why? Because they have closed their hearts. They have closed their ears to this truth. And so therefore, for that reason, they're deceived and they are being deceived. He says, behold, I am going to rebuke your seed and I will spread refuse or doo-doo, dung, feces on your faces, the refuse of your feasts, and you will be taken away with it. So in other words, <laughs> these so-called festivals and feasts that you have and your heart is not fully devoted to me, um, uh, I'm going to take the refuse of your feast, the things that you throw away with, your the your, the stuff that you congested and you ate in the feces that can I'm going to, he says, I'm going to, he says, I am going to uh, spread the refuse on your faces, the refuse of your feast, and you will be taken away with it. So you'll be flushed down the toilet along with it. Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant May continue with Levi, says Yahweh of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him as something to be feared. So he feared me and stood in awe of my name. So the covenant of the priest giving instruction was given to Levi at Mount Sinai, all right, through Mose, Moses. Instruction of truth was in his mouth. And unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. And he turned many from iniquity because that is the job of the priest. That is the job of the pastor. How is it that you're going to turn a parishioner, a person in your congregation, away from iniquity, from wrong, from evil, from sin, from a lack of knowledge, if you're not prepared to give them an answer? If you're not even willing to give them an answer, you are dismissive because you don't even want to entertain. You don't even think that their questions are worthy to be entertained because you don't feel that you are accountable to them. He says, for the lips of a priest should keep knowledge. So he should keep, always be able to prepare to give an answer. He should always have knowledge on his lips. He should stay with knowledge on his lips. And men should seek instruction. So men should be able to come to him to seek answers, to seek information, to seek knowledge, right, from his mouth, for he is the messenger of Yahweh of hosts. That's your job. Your job is to be the middleman, which is the mouthpiece, which is the one who gives answers, who gives instructions to those who have questions. But as for you, this is what you did. Just like in Jeremiah 23 with the prophets. But as for you, you have turned aside from the way. So you've turned people away. You've caused people to leave your pews. You've caused people to decide to go into Buddhism. You decide, you've caused people to go into Islam. You've caused people to become atheists and agnostic. You've caused people to... Turn away from Almighty Yahweh. Why? Because you have not acted as a messenger of him. You have only been a spokesperson for your denominations, for your seminaries, for your, your, your local non-denominational churches, whatever the organization, whatever the institution, you were more loyal to your traditions and your customs of men than you were of Yahweh. So, I also made you despise and low before all this. So that's the reason why when you look at television, there's this attitude of disrespect that people have. There used to be a time in America where if you were considered a clergy, um, you were respected. But now we, we live in a time where you know, that it is very common that you can see on television mocking 
and not taking serious um, the role of those who are the spokespersons or the messengers or the mouthpieces of Yahweh. It's not a respected uh, field or, te- uh, or, 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 um, or title to wear because of you guys, because of you who deliberately take the word and you pick and choose. Notice what he says. So I also made you despise and low before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in the instructions. So you are editing the scriptures. You are editing the word of Yahweh. You're the ones that are putting emphasis. You're the one that took out the Apocrypha. You're the one that took out Maccabees and Esdras. You're the one that took out uh, Sirach, Ecclesiasticus. You're the one who decided to edit, but yet you put more emphasis in John Calvin, as I said. You put more emphasis in uh, Jerome. You put more emphasis in Martin Luther. You put more emphasis in uh, Wesley and Calvin uh, and um, and Spurgeon and the like. You put more emphasis on these quote-unquote so-called leaders of the Christian church than you do what my word says. And that's the problem that I have with you, he says. That's the reason why you are not regarded with high esteem. You are despised and you are made low before all the people. Another passage definitely to look at is Titus. Hopefully you guys are getting something out of this this morning. I know I'd be all over the place, but, you know, clearly I hope and I pray and I trust uh, that this is coming before you um, with clarity. So he says here, first um, in Titus, the first chapter in the seventh verse, he says, for the overseer must be beyond reproach. He must be uh, beyond accusation of any of the sins that we may have even talked about and the sins that we haven't even talked about. So no one should be able to be able to um, make an accusation accusation against you and, and you be guilty of that. So in other words, it, impl- it implies that in order to be an overseer, you got to be perfect in these regards. This is the qualification. He says for an overseer must be beyond reproach as Yahweh's steward not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, uh, and not uh, pug- pugnacious, not f- fond of dishonest gain, but hospitable. Mm. Know how to treat guests. Know how to treat people that are within your house. Loving what is good, sensible, righteous, uh, holy, self-controlled. Right. So you got to be perfect in all of these, he's saying. Right. Because you got to be beyond reproach of any of these things. Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching. So that he will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and reprove those who contradict. Hmm. Interesting. He's got to hold fast the faithful word. He's got to hold fast all of scripture as being inspired by Yahweh. He has to hold fast to that. It, at the point that you are separating and you're saying, oh, well, this may have been taught there, but I'm going to take this part out. Oh, I'm not going to add this to my doctrine. I'm not going to add this to my teach. At the point that you're doing as the point that you're not holding fast to it. Uh, with in, in accordance with the t- with the teaching, so that he will be able. You are not able to give answers on biblical polygyny. You are not able to give answers on uh, the flat Earth theory, uh, which my brother Larry espouses, um, and and we're going to explore that one even further. But you're not able to give answers concerning eschatology. You're not able to give answers concerning, you know, what is the assembly? What is church? What is the church? 
What is the ecclesia? You're not able to give answer on what tithing truly is because you have taken certain parts of it, certain aspects of it, and you've omitted it. You kept some and you've omitted others. And so, so that he will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and reprove those who contradict. So you're in no position to reprove. What does reprove mean? Let's 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 look at these words. Exhort and reprove. Let's see what it says here. Exhort. All right, this is G 3870. And it is the Greek word parakaleo. Parakaleho. Leho. All right. All right. So let's see what it says. It is to call to one side, call for a sermon, for call for or to summon, to address, to speak, right? Uh, it is to admonish, which is to exhort. It is to admonish, um, beseech. That means you urge strongly, to beg, to strive, to appease by entreaty, uh, to console. Wow. So uh, it, you're consoling someone who uh, has a question. They have a difficulty, a challenge, and, and they can't seem to answer it or, or remedy it. You're supposed to console them. So it, are you consoling when you, you're being dismissive? Are you supposed to comfort them? If they're not at ease with their understanding, you're supposed to comfort them. You're supposed to encourage and strengthen, instruct. You're supposed to teach. That's what a teacher does. A teacher gives information, answers questions, instructs. That's what they do, but you can't, you need you can't even begin to instruct if you are at variance with the truth. Um, and let me see, refute. And this is so you're also you're all supposed to be able to read, and this is Eling, Eling, Elenko. Elenko, Elenko, right? <laughs> let me let me let me click it and see what it says. Elenko, Elenko, that's it. All right. Okay. Thank you for that, sir. All right. So, what is this? When you refute, you convict. You confute, generally with the suggestion of shame of the person convicted, by conviction to bring to the light to expose. Okay, you're supposed to expose what what is really being said that the person is not getting that they're not they're not grasping, right? That's what you're supposed to do. It's also correcting to find fault, but you can't correct if you're not correct. <laughs> you can't correct if you're not correct. Okay, all right. It is to convict, refute, confute, generally with the suggestion of the shame of the person convicted. All right. So let's stop right there. Let's let's pull out of here. I don't want to spend too much time on that. I think we get the point. All right. So these are the things that an overseer, a pastor, must do. You must be in the position and you must be willing to, you know, you must be in a position of holding fast the faithful word. And you must be in a position to be able to to exhort and sound doctrine. How can if your doctrine is not sound, you're not going to be able to do this successfully. You got to get your doctrine sound first. Your doctrine of dismissing people is not even sound. You have to get that right first before you can proceed. Before you'll be able to help people, rather than turn them away, which is what you've been doing. Oh man. Oh, oh yeah, this is a good one right here. James, James 5. Five. James 5. And thank you guys for allowing me to be me, be natural, <laughs> and to flow. And um, you know, bear with me. I trust again, and I pray that you're getting something out of this. So James 5, and we're gonna start with verse 19. He says, my brothers, if any among you strays from the truth. So sometimes there are those among us who, 
whatever reasons, um, get a hold of some information. We become duped by the enemy and uh, we stray from the truth, uh, whether it be emotionally driven or whether it be uh, intellectually driven, uh, we become stray, strays from the truth. Um, it says, my brothers, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, so someone can turn him back or does turn him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Pastors, that which that's what you do. That's the gain in this. That's the that's the reward in this, is that you get to exemplify love which covers a multitude of sins. You 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 become a rescuer of that person's soul from death. You you save that person from uh, the end of perdition. You save that person from being doomed. You, you, you rescue them from the path that is about to ultimately destroy them. And so that's what you do. And that's why it's all the more significant and it behooves you that you must be in the business of answering questions and, and not avoiding challenges to your beliefs and, and your policy and, and the statements of faith that you have on your website. No, it, 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 if, if you put it up there, it doesn't mean that it's etched in stone. It is not the scripture. It is not the Bible. You should be, it should be tested. I uh, got another one for you. Second Corinthians, you pastors who think that you have, your doctrine has fully arrived, right? <laughs> Notice what Paul says here to the church at Corinth. He says, test yourselves. Pastor, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, pastors. Or do you not recognize about yourselves that Yeshua HaMashiach is in you unless indeed you fail the test? So what are you afraid to test? You know, I, matter of fact, if I, as a pastor, if I'm a pastor of a local congregation and I'm leading people and I'm responsible and I have to give an account as Hebrews uh, tells us, the book of Hebrews tells us, if I have to give an account for their souls and I want to make sure that I'm doing it, I'm leading them in the right way, and then in the end, only find that I failed the test. So I, it, it behooves me to keep testing me, myself. Paul says, but I hope that you realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. So in other words, he speaks this in the present tense as though he and his companions and the apostles were always in a state of testing themselves. We saw this with him in Galatians 2 when he talked about how when he first came to the faith and he went through that period um, when he went away and then he came back, I think after two years, you know, he... Um, you know, he started preaching, but he, he, he was compelled to go to Jerusalem, right, where the apostles were. And he wanted to speak to those who were pillars in this faith. And he wanted to test if what he was saying or doing was in alignment with the truth. So even he recognized the importance and the significance of testing oneself. So when when you pastors are put yourself in a place where nobody can test you, when you put yourselves in a place where you 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 don't have to be accountable to no one, not even your congregation, right? It's a dangerous place to be in, and that is a place that is ripened for delusion and deception, deceiving and being deceived. The word says. Uh, give me the last scripture here. This I'm going to end off with this one right here. Acts 18. Okay. Uh, this is this is an example 
of what happens when when someone is who's not seeing things don't have a good grasp and the importance of being able to um straighten them out and what you can produce you know by helping someone who doesn't have a full accurate picture of what uh, scripture actually says um, who is who may be missing a few things or maybe in contradiction to a few things and so when you're able to set them right th this is the potential benefit of doing this and there's this man here uh who was teaching uh verse 24 and he was he was a yehudin right and it says now a Yehudin, a Yehudin named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, right? So he was he was born in Egypt, right? Uh, go, let lets us know that there was there was still a lot of Yehudin. There was a lot of Israelites that were in in Africa, in Egypt, right? Even though Israel is a part of Egypt, I mean, is a part of Africa. It's the western part of Africa. This whole idea of you know the Middle East. It's not a biblical concept, and certainly in earlier maps, uh, certainly in the first century and beyond, um, the Middle East is, is wasn't even a concept. It's a relatively new concept within the past 100 years or so that was developed. So he says, now a Yehudin named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man. So this was an eloquent man. This was a man that was well, you know, he could speak well. He was intelligent arrived at Ephesus, right? So even though you're intelligent, it goes to show that you, you, you can miss it. Arrived at Ephesus, right? And he was mighty in the scripture. So you could be mighty, you could be powerful. You can know a lot in the word of God. Any of us can know a lot in the word of God, yet still miss certain things, still not fully understand certain things, still not fully get it. So if, if this is the case with us as teachers and preachers that we we can we can get it wrong right it's certainly with the 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 parishioner the person that's not a have does not have a title so it, it's all the more important that we put ourselves in a position to be able to answer them so he says this man had been instructed in the way of the lord right or the messiah and being fervent in Ruach, in the spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Yeshua, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. So this was the limitation of his doctrine, right? He, he, he was not, uh, he did not know a lot more of what Yeshua taught because he uh, was obviously more of a disciple of John or he only knew more about John. And so he uh, he was only acquainted with John's baptism, but he wasn't acquainted with the baptism that the disciples were doing, the apostles were doing of, of, of Messiah. And so verse 18, it says, and he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. So he's out publicly speaking, right? And so he got a, he, um, an outward ministry, a public ministry. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of Yahweh more accurately. So what did they do? I mean, they didn't both, they didn't blast him on social media. You know, they didn't call him a false teacher. You know, they didn't put it uh, up, you know, uh, how would you say, try to destroy him publicly, you know, assassinate him. No, they didn't try, they didn't do that. They did with gentleness and with respect, with loving fear and respect, they pulled him to the side and they explained to him the way more accurately. And when, and okay, so after doing that, and when he wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him. So obviously at this point, he accepted the accurate teaching, the, the full teaching that he received from Priscilla and and so they he the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. So they sent him to Achaia, 
right? And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. So he became a great help to the saints. He became a great help to the body of Yeshua. He became a great help to the assembly. For he powerfully refuted the Jew. Why? Because only pastors, the thing that you're going to do is you're only going to arm and prime people who are going to be equipped to further go out and do the work on a more greater scale. You're only going to add to the kingdom. You're only going to enhance what's already going on by the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, in the, the church, in the assembly, in the, the ministry of Yeshua. That's what you're going to do. He powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures. So he used the scriptures. He used uh, those uh, writings that were those sacred writings, uh, Paul says, that um, was inspired by Yahweh that Yeshua is the Messiah. So that's what he used. He used it and he was able to accurately do it as he, someone pulled him to the side in love and gently explained to them. They weren't dismissive to him because they, they could have been dismissive towards him or they could have blast him on, on Instagram. You know, which, which approach was more better here? Obviously there was the approach that they took. So, what are we saying here? Pastors need to stop avoiding challenges to their beliefs because you're hurting the body of Messiah. You are hurting the, the mission of the truth of sacred scriptures. You, you are hurting many people and you are turning them away uh, by your deception, your ignorance, your bias, your, your inaccurate understanding of the whole of scripture uh your inaccurate doctrine and you you're you're sending people to destruction and in turn you yourselves will be ending up in destruction if you don't repent from this and you don't turn from this arrogant attitude of feeling as though you know you have fully arrived when you haven't even gotten through the door yourself so I encourage you, I encourage you uh, to just look at these scriptures that I that I laid out today, this morning. Um, to those of you who chimed in and uh, looked at this stream, looked at this link, whether if it's on the replay or not, I pray that you got something. If you like it, do like it. Uh, and if you have never subscribed to my channel, do subscribe. Go through. <clears throat> my um list of videos that i have there's other content that i have on there and um you know do share it with others don't don't keep that love to yourself and uh until then uh for king and kingdom i bid you shalom keep digging in his word until then take care y'all bless until the next time i love you mm -hmm.